America, the Creation of a New Nation. The objective for this lecture is to understand the political, social, and economic structures of the new nation. During the American Revolution, the founders didn't agree on everything. All colonists in North America didn't agree that they should form a new nation. Many colonists saw themselves as British. About 30% were loyal to the British crown. One-fifth to two-fifths of colonists were neutral or apathetic, such as the Quakers. 90% of the country was rural or physically, geographically, from where the action of the revolution was happening, which was in the coastal cities. So, a number of people were actually checked out during the American Revolution. But two-fifths of the colonists were patriots. So if everyone didn't agree that the question becomes, how do they form a new nation, a new republic? What was that going to look like? What was this new republic going to look like? The 1770s, 1780s, and 1790s were all important to our understanding of the founding of the nation. We will continue to work out disagreements about what the country looks like, how we prioritize our values, what is the definition of citizen, etc. But the architecture of this system was created in those final three decades that I mentioned, the 1770s, 1780s, and 1790s. The colonists' first attempt at a new government was called the Articles of Confederation. It was the Republic's first written constitution. It's referred to as the League of Friendship. The colonists were very worried about too much centralized power, and the Articles of Confederation is reflective of that. In the Articles, 13 states had individual sovereignty. There was one House of Congress, and each member casted one vote, regardless of the population of the state. There was no president, no judiciary. Major decisions required approval of nine states. They had a national government, but that national government could only declare war, conduct foreign affairs, and make treaties with other governments. Congress could coin money, but Congress couldn't levy taxes or raise taxes. Congress couldn't regulate commerce. So the revenue came from contributions from the states and any amendment to the Articles required unanimous consent of the state. So the weakness of the Articles of Confederation is that it didn't have a lot of power to do much of anything, and trying to get everyone to agree on something was difficult. So as a result, crisis occurred. An economic crisis, social crisis, and political crisis. They had a crisis of a national debt. Seven years of fighting the revolution took its toll, and so individual states accumulated debt. And Congress had paid for the war by printing money, which now had lost its value, and this resulted in inflation and a fluctuation in prices. There will be a lot of violence uh, that occur because of this economic crisis. Their economy will go into a deep depression beginning in the 1780s and lasting until the 1790s. This economic crisis led to a social crisis. And the social crisis was that people couldn't afford to feed their families. And this will lead to rebellion. 
in the main rebellion here was Shay's Rebellion. And this was a political crisis. Shay's Rebellion occurred between 1786 and 1787. And its historical significance was that it exposed the weaknesses in the Articles of Confederation. And it made it clear the Articles of Confederation was not strong enough to hold the nation together. Shay's Rebellion was led by Daniel Shay, who was a Revolutionary War veteran. And what led to this rebellion was the economic crisis. If you remember, the Articles doesn't allow Congress to levy taxes, and so the states are responsible for raising the revenue. So how the states did that was their legislatures taxed the colonists for the war debts that they had accumulated over the past seven years. So these property taxes that the state legislatures issued rose by 60% in three years. Now also remember the money had lost its value, so the state legislatures required the colonists to pay these property taxes in gold and silver. And when they couldn't pay those taxes, they took their property. And at this time, voting qualifications was tied to property, so you had to own property to vote. So that meant many lost their political power as well. So they were obviously angry uh, and rebelled. For the most part, many of the founding fathers thought this was a legitimate rebellion. In fact, Thomas Jefferson thought a little rebellion was a good thing, that of course Anytime you're going to have a revolution, you're going to have a little bit of a rebellion. Nothing to worry about. But all, all of the Founding Fathers agreed on this. Um, for example, James Madison was concerned about the rebellion. So what ends up happening is they turn back the Articles of Confederation and basically start over and create a new constitution. The Constitution created in 1789 uh, it was the result of a constitutional convention where the delegates were people like George Washington, Ben Franklin, and James Madison. They were all educated elites. And the Constitution was derived from two plans that came out of the debates. The plans were the Virginia Plan and the New, Jer New Jersey Plan. The Virginia Plan was one that Madison was in favor of, said that there would be a two-house legislature and that state population determine representation in each house. So this clearly benefits such as Virginia. The New Jersey Plan called for a single house legislature and each state gets one vote. Because the smaller states were worried about the larger states like Virginia having too much power. So this benefited the smaller states. So the end result was both the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan were adopted. And this resulted in a two-house Congress. And the two House Congress included a Senate and House of Representatives. And we still have those today. In the Senate, each state got two members chosen by state legislatures for six year terms. That has since changed. They are no longer uh, chosen by state legislatures. They're actually 
uh, directly elected by the people. In the House of Representatives, it was apportioned according to population. And it, was, and it was, those representatives were chosen by popular vote. Now, Congress' responsibilities were that they could levy taxes, they could borrow money, they could regulate commerce, they could declare war, they dealt with issues of foreign nations and with issues of Indians, and ultimately their job was to promote the general welfare. The judiciary included a Supreme Court, and the members of the Supreme Court were to be appointed by the President for life terms. That's still the case. Now they are appointed and they have to have the approval of the Senate. The executive branch included the President, and the President was chosen by an electoral college. And in, in the event there was a tie in the Electoral College, then the House of Representatives uh, chose, chose the representatives. The Constitution created a division of powers. This is called federalism. And it's the relationship between the national government and the states. So the state has certain powers, the federal government has certain powers, and then they have certain shared powers. The states could not infringe on property rights, couldn't issue paper money, couldn't impair contracts, couldn't interfere with interstate commerce, and couldn't levy their own import or export dues. But they could implement education and they could have a law enforcement system. And then the federal government powers basically everything that the states couldn't do. As for shared powers, an example of shared powers is actually law enforcement or it will become law enforcement. Uh, for example, the federal government uh, has a federal law enforcement, such as the FBI, and then, of course, the states have their own law enforcement system as well. So that's just an example of a shared power. A separation of powers will be created in the Constitution. In other words, it's something called checks and balances. And this is really the heart of American democracy, is this checks and balances system. The checks and balances system prevents each branch of government from dominating the other. If you remember, in the articles, uh, they did not want a centralized power. They didn't want to have one person or branch of government to have too much power, and this is why they created the checks and balance system um, in the Constitution. Examples of the checks and balances system are that Congress enacts laws, but the President can veto them, but Congress can override that veto with a two-thirds majority. Federal judges are nominated by the President, but they have to be approved by Congress. Judges serve for life, but uh, judges can uh, be impeached by the Congress. The President can also be impeached uh, by the House of Representatives and then removed by the Senate for high crimes and misdemeanors. The Constitution does not explicitly talk about citizenship. It doesn't state who can 
be a citizen, and it doesn't state how to become a citizen. Citizenship will be defined in the Naturalization Act of 1790, and citizenship will be restricted to free white persons. However, the Constitution does implicitly state who will not be a citizen, such as Native Americans. In Article 1, Section 2, it states, Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union, according to the respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. This is actually the three-fifths clause as a result of the three-fifths compromise involving slavery, and I will discuss that clause in the context of slavery in a few minutes. But here, they are excluding Indians. Indians will be treated as part of independent tribes. Slavery is discussed in the Constitution and slaves will not be citizens. Article 1, Section 9 talks about slavery. It states, The migration or importation of such persons as many of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808. But a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. So what this uh, article and section is saying is that they are going to get rid of the slave trade in the year 1808. Uh, meaning they're going to get rid of the slave trade but not get rid of the institution of slavery itself. Because the Founding Fathers kind of grappled with the morality of slavery, or at least some of the Founding Fathers did. So they wanted to get rid of the slave trade, but not necessarily slavery as an institution. And they have the opportunity to do so here, and they don't. And why? Because they were making money off of slavery. Article 4, Section 2 also talks about slavery. No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from service or labor, but shall be delivered upon a claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. What this is talking about is fugitive slaves, meaning if a slave escapes, then they are to be returned to their owner. Again, they're talking about slavery in the Constitution. They have an opportunity to get rid of it, and they don't. They actually put it in there. The Three-Fifths Compromise. Article 1, Section 2. And I stated this already, but it says three-fifths of all other persons. So what happened here is that there was concern over counting slaves as part of the population with respect to taxes and representation in Congress. So there was deb a debate over that because Obviously, the southern states are going to have a lot more slaves because they have plantation slaves. So there was concern by the smaller states that the larger states would get more representation. So the compromise was that they would count slaves as three-fifths of a person in terms of states paying taxes and in terms of representation uh, in Congress. There was a constitutional debate. The debate over the Constitution caused the rise of the first political parties, the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. The Federalist included the gentlemen you see here, Alexander Hamilton, 
James Madison, and John Jay. The Federalists were pro-ratification of the Constitution. All of the elements that I mentioned earlier that made it into the Constitution, they were in favor of. The Federalists were property owners, the landed rich, including farmers that were close to commercial centers, and merchants. The Anti-Federalists included gentlemen such as Thomas Jefferson. The Anti-Federalists were against the ratification of the Constitution. They sought greater protection of individual rights. They wanted stronger state governments at the expense of the federal government. They wanted frequent elections, smaller districts, and more direct democracy. Anti-Federalists were small farmers, shopkeepers, and laborers. They believed in the decency of the common man. In the end, the Constitution will be ratified, originally without the Bill of Rights. But as part of a compromise between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists to ratify the Constitution, the Federalists promised a Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights are a list of individual rights. But the Bill of Rights will come after the ratification, but not long after the ratification and will be ultimately included in the Constitution. The Bill of Rights include the First Amendment, which is freedom of speech, press, and the right of assembly. The Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms in conjunction with a well-regulated militia, and the other eight uh, amendments. This ends your lecture. If you have any questions, please let me know.